And then, less than 24 hours later, it all changed. After a furious reaction to the vote, the government reversed its plans to overhaul the standards process and Owen Paterson resigned as an MP, saying he now wanted a life outside the cruel world of politics. So we've called Ian Dunton to the podcast for an emergency resignation section. (laughs) Ian, Wednesday was a depressing and enraging day uh, for people who care about parliamentary standards and uh, integrity and so on. And then Thursday uh, was relatively hilarious. What did you make of all this? Were you taken by surprise? Yeah, I think the speed of it, the the speed and the the depth of the breakdown is quite surprising. I mean, you did sort of get the sense that this can't possibly hold and you could feel the anger rising um, last night and sort of this morning. You know, Boris Johnson is quite quick to change when he thinks it's going to make himself unpopular. The only real counterexample to that is the Barnard Castle sort of incident where he stuck firm and did himself real damage. Mm. I don't think he's going to make that mistake again. Um, and so they, they, I wasn't expecting the complete collapse in everything that they tried to achieve. Nor, nor was Quasi Quartang. <laughs> nor was Quasi Quartang. He spent the morning out there defending, much like the MPs who voted for it, in the blithe and now I think quite naive assumption that, and that Downing Street might actually back him up. And apparently <laughs> nor was Patterson himself, who found out about this from Laura Kunzberg when he was in the supermarket. And realise that he's going to be sacrificed, basically, so that the Tories can get themselves out of a spot of bother. But also, I think, and this is like the crucial political part, to try and secure the changes that they want to make to the standards process because of what they think is going to hit them in future for things like the Downing Street refurbishment, for COVID contracts, for all the other various sleazy, corrupt ways that they've behaved. Right. So what happens to this attempt to reform the standards process? Fuck knows. So um, we had Jacob Rees-Mogg, he stood up in the comments today and said, oh, I'm very, he said, I, I fear last night's debate has conflated, that was his quote, conflated the individual case with a general concern. Now that is disingenuous to the point of extremity because he himself, when he was presenting the motion, didn't, the motion is basically saying Batson's now going to be suspended for 30 days. He didn't even discuss any of that. He just, just spent the entire time discussing the amendment that had been put forward by Leadsom. So he himself had been extremely active to the point of ignoring the individual case in conflating the two things. He then today stood up and went, oh, we've had a bit of a bother. So we're going to go back and try and come up with a cross-party way of doing this. Now, when we had the debate yesterday, Labour and the SNP have said that they're not going to sit on the committee. And they clearly didn't see that this was a massive vulnerability in the government plan, that if the opposition parties just don't participate, the whole thing collapses in on itself. Nevertheless, they've done that now. And so the Tories are going to have to find a way, presumably by getting rid of the stitched in lock they have by virtue of John Whittingdale sitting as the chairman, that it does whatever the Tories say. They're going to have to allow that the Tories don't get to decide what that committee does. But it does seem that they are going to try and push ahead with those plans. And then the question will fall to Labour, to the SNP, to the Lib Dems, do you want to take part in this? Because ultimately, the thing is, there's actually, despite what some quite august sort of detached people are saying, there's really nothing wrong with our current standards process. And you can actually watch the way that it has behaved um, very admirably, actually, I think, over the Patterson incident. It has the commissioner who goes in, who does the initial report, that is then looked at by the Committee on Standards, which is the chair of Chris Bryant, but has three Tory MPs on there. It might even be four, actually. Several lay people. It's a cross-party group. They sometimes overrule the commissioner. Sometimes they don't. That is a de facto appeal process, no matter matter how Jacob Rees-Mogg tries to pretend otherwise. And then it goes off to a vote in the House of Commons, which they do not have to accept, as we witnessed last night. So the the process itself is sound. There's really very... I, I can't think of a genuine reason why you would want to change it up very much. But nevertheless, the government will press ahead with it. And now opposition parties are going to have to decide whether they want to be involved in it. So can you clarify this? Because obviously this is billed as a U-turn, which often makes people think that it's as if it never happened. What has been reversed? Which bit has been reversed and, and which bit is staying if they're still pressing ahead with some kind of reform? Right. So let's break it down. So for the first part, the first thing that's been reversed is that they're getting Owen Patterson out of trouble. So they were then saying, well, look, we're going to bring a motion, you know, and we will vote on whether he gets chucked out for 30 days. The expectation was that he would get chucked out for 30 days and that there would then be triggered sort of a confidence vote and we'd see a by-election. Now he has fallen on his own sword. So that becomes kind of null and void. And we are going to see a by-election in that seat. The second part that's changed is that the original plan was for the Leadsom plan was to set up a committee 
that was going to have eight members, four Tories, four opposition parties, with a chair, John Whittingdale, Tory grandee, who would have the deciding vote. So you basically just say, really, whatever the Tories want to do, that's what's going to happen. Now, Jacob Rees-Mogg hasn't actually said what they're going to replace it with. He just sort of said, right. we're, going to, uh, we're going to have a little think about this and see, see what we can come up with. We don't have any more details than that. But by virtue of him saying that it has to be cross-party, there's an acknowledgement there that you can't have a system where the Tories have the deciding vote, because that was the factor that made it so unpalatable to the Commons, well, at least to opposition MPs yesterday. So that we can conclude, we can at least deduce that much. The rest of it we know nothing about. And by the way, probably neither do they. <laughs> you know, I don't think that they have a secret plan right now. It's just like fucking panic stations, basically. And let's just, you know, we'll just get rid of it and hope that we can survive this. So what went wrong uh, for the Tories? Because the Tories and I think the Nothing Matters school of punditry say, look, they've got this, this massive majority. People out there in the red wall, the only part of Britain that matters, um, <laughs> don't care about this Westminster bubble nonsense. And they can basically do what they want. And of course, that's exactly how they behave, that it seemed outrageous to us. And yet they just press their heads, three line whip, go for it. Um, and then suddenly it's like, oh, no, we didn't realize there'd be this huge backlash. Like, it seems like astonishing. Like, how could you not? How could you be so confident as to have a three line whip? And they'd be so startled that people thought that this was corrupt. that You have to reverse it. What miscalculation was made? You know, every time you tweet something right about oh, the Tories are dreadful, they've done this thing with sewage, or they've done this thing with Brexit, whatever. And someone will reply to you on Twitter going, you know, that meme of Tories plus 10, latest Ipsos Mori, you know, they're invulnerable. Well, the thing is, I mean, lots of people on the sort of liberal left really think that way. And crucially, I think Boris Johnson also thinks that way. I think he thinks he's invulnerable. This government does think that it really can't touch the sides. They've got a grasp. Labour is useless. They can channel culture war whenever they want in this really intuitive, emotive, effortless sort of way, and no one can touch them. The thing is, that seems to me the thing that sets them up for a fall. It did it in Barnard Castle. It didn't do it over COVID. It does do it now. And the thing is, because I think people who read a lot of the news can't always dis sort of distinguish the things that are going to actually really cause a public upset and the things that can't because we're often really quite upset about all of the stuff that they're doing. But certain key moments that are so glaringly unfair, that are so obviously wrong, will do them damage, especially if it taps into key assumptions that people already have about them. And that is what happened here. You can kind of tell a bit of a bellwether on this, just like with Barnard Castle, with the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail is what shows you. No point looking at the sun. I mean, the sun went out of its fucking way on Thursday morning to pretend that nothing had ever happened in Parliament. And there was nowhere to be found on the front page. It won't be the Telegraph, you know, which will do everything, despite the fact that it broke the MP's expenses story and once acted like it was standing up for standards. Now, of course, couldn't give a fuck about any of that because it's got its boy in power. But it's the Mail. Because the male, obviously, grotesque reactionary filth that it often pumps out, and yet it has a sense of instinctive fairness. When something, I don't like its sense of fairness, I don't share it, but it has it. It is genuine and it exists outside of the power politics um, of Westminster. So when they get their back up about something, you get a pretty good sense of, oh, no, hang on a minute. This is one of those things that, this is one of those things that people instinctively feel, you know, right in their guts is wrong. And that's pretty much what happened here. We should not take resignation letters at face value. Um, Patterson was just like, I've did nothing wrong and it's a dirty business and I want nothing more to do with it. I plan to devote my time to, to Lynn's Farm Fresh Foods. Why do you think he did resign so, so quickly? Do you think there was any pressure on him to do so? Or was it just like the, you know, the humiliation of, of the suspension? I have no idea. I would assume that it was the latter and that he thinks that this process will go on and on and on and on and probably result in a by-election, which he would have a pretty good chance of losing. You know, whereas before he would have had the 30-day suspension. This is all he's doing, by the way, so I don't really feel any sympathy. He'd have had the 30-day suspension. I don't think they would have triggered a by-election. I don't think there would have been the public interest in the petition to get to the level required to trigger it. Now there was clearly going to be a by-election, and worse, he would now be the face of sleaze because, and this is worth repeating and worth remembering for all of the disinformation that his allies are throwing out there, he is guilty as fucking 
charge. Like you read the report, it is absolutely comprehensive. It is conclusive. It was a pattern of behavior. It's written down in emails. He persistently operated in the name of his clients in order to get rid of competitors, in order to increase their market provision while acting like he was doing it in the public interest or for public health, which he manifestly was not doing. He was guilty. Of and that was it. The funny part about all this was looking at the government and thinking, this is the fucking case you want to attach your attempt to reform the system too. Like you could, I, I could think of at least sort of offhand five or six MPs whose cases were much more mild than what Patterson had done. So really on that basis, I think he just didn't fancy going through the remorseless kind of degrading logic that the next few weeks and months would entail. I, I don't know if you share this. It, it's difficult with the, um, okay, with the wife situation. Because you obviously do feel like a tremendous amount of, I mean, I get it. And I don't question any of the parts where he says, you know, there's no point, there's no meaning in life and all that, you know, after she's gone. And, and obviously that knocks you, especially when you're spending all day basically just laughing at, at what's happening on Twitter. And then you're like, oh, when you look at the accusation he made towards the commissioner, Kathleen Stone, who had, did her job absolutely impeccably and in, absolutely fair and square, was that his wife committed suicide because of her investigation. You know, then late, that was him saying that, you know, then we had Jacob Rees-Mogg in the Commons yesterday saying, you know, hasn't he been punished enough? As if, you know, basically using this, this woman who was an actual woman with an actual life as a human shield so that he could deliver this really tawdry reform, you know, towards, towards the standards process. So you, you, you find yourself in this really contorted emotional position where you do obviously genuinely feel very, very sorry for him. But also it has to be said that some of the use of this woman over the last few days has, uh, has been extremely dispiriting. Before we go, uh, I want a quick mention for Angela Richardson MP's whirlwind 24 hours where she uh, <laughs> rebelled by abstaining on the amendment, uh, was therefore sacked as Michael Gove's PPS, uh, tweeted how sad she was. And then this morning was reappointed as Michael Gove's PPS and tweeted about how excited she was to be back. <laughs> to face the new challenge. <laughs> yeah. Just just amazing. I hope she enjoyed her time off. Um, but I just wanted to ask finally about this this by-election that, that is, is now going to happen. North Shropshire is remarkable. He had a, a 23,000 vote majority with 63% of the vote. So is there any chance, even with all of this kind of uh, sleaze, that the Tories would lose that seat? Very, very minor chance. I think there was a much bigger chance if he had stayed because you can make mm. him the face of sleaze, right? But he's gone. Um, this is not a seat that you would expect to fall. Um, and it probably won't. However, if, if one of the parties, Lib Dems or Labour, probably Labour because they're, they're in second place, can just find a proper sort of anti-corruption, anti-sleaze candidate, a Martin Bell for the 2020s, basically, and just put them forward, maybe even, and I'm, I know I'm dreaming my, my highest and most unlikely dreams here, maybe even to the point that the other party would sort of sit down and go, oh, well, you know, if this is a by-election on corruption, we don't have to run, and just turn it into, you know, a, basically a referendum, a sort of by-election referendum on sleaze and corruption, then, you know, it's not impossible. I mean, we've seen, you know, when you look at Cheshire and Amersham for the Lib Dems, that was, you're, you're talking not dissimilar sort of levels of what needs to be done. So that is not impossible. It does require, I think, Labour and the Lib Dems to, to work together. And it does require someone, a candidate who can encapsulate and turn it into a referendum on corruption. So whether they'll manage to satisfy those things, I'm not sure. And even if they do, you still probably wouldn't bet that they would achieve it, given how safe that seat is. But it would make it a possibility.